morning, everybody, and welcome to our, I think this is our third presentation with TLC. I'm Maureen Campiola. I'm the marketing person for your key to senior living options, and I'm going to turn it over to Lisa Honka, who will introduce our wonderful speaker for today. Just want to remind everybody that uh, we, if you do not want to be recorded in any way, shape, or form, you are being recorded, you can go to shutting off your video. This way you won't be on the recording. At the end of the presentation, before we open it up to questions and answers, we stop the recording so that if there is any kind of question, personal question that you want to ask live, it is not recorded in any way, shape, or form. So just want to put all those little disclaimers out there for folks. Okay. So Lisa, I'm going to go to you. Hello, good morning, everyone. Hi there, I'm Lisa Honka, and I am so excited to hear what Bonnie has to teach us today. Um, it's been an amazing journey with TLC, uh, sharing tips on how to get through this pandemic and um, how we're going to survive this together. So thanks, everybody, for joining us. And Bonnie, go ahead, take it away. Tell us a little bit about you and TLC, and um, we'll start our presentation. Thank you so much, Lisa. I wasn't seeing your video, so maybe you can switch it. There you are. Hi. There go. <laughs> so good to see you, and thank you for that. Yes, I'm Bonnie Hovel, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I've been with TLC for about two years. And TLC stands for Transition Life Consultant. We have about 20 uh, counselors, and they're all mental health professionals retired, and we have social workers, psychologists, mental health counselors, and uh, marriage and family therapists. And we're all licensed and insured with the help of United Way, our partners. And we do the kinds of things you see, you just saw on that slide. Uh, we do presentations like this, educational presentation. We do support groups for things such as weight loss, grief support, um, caregiver support, and we do training. So we do all of these things and we don't charge. We do one-on-one -on -one counseling also for individuals and we don't charge anything, but we do ask for donations and gratefully accept them because we do have some expenses that go with running any organization. So I'm happy that you're all here with us today. It's very nice to have you here. And um, next slide, please. So the topic today is coping skills when you're at home. This is the third in our series, as Maureen mentioned. The first one, Pat Hayes talked about kind of all the faces that grief has and all the things that we're dealing with, all the losses that we're dealing with, and then how normal that is. And then in the second one, Lou talked about making friends with ourselves, taking the time, you know, to show ourselves some compassion in all of this. And now this third one will give you some steps for at home, some ideas and suggestions of specific skills that you can use to help you yourself. Next slide, please. Okay, this is a quote from Paul Tillich. And I like what he says is because some of us are alone, really no one else, living with no one else. And I think that magnifies the problems that we've been having over the past few months and trying to cope with. Because if you don't have anyone to talk over how you're feeling, it just kind of makes it more um, heightened and that's difficult. And that's where the word loneliness comes in and the pain. And then, but there's another side to that. The word solitude expresses, he says, the glory of being alone. So there may be some advantages to that in some ways. If, um, if we can, you know, if we can see that there are things we can do ourselves and nobody else is going to be there kind of judging us or keeping us from following our own path. So that's kind of what I get out of this quote. Next slide, please. So we have some big picture choices. Um, we can shield ourselves build up walls and just kind of let that tension stay inside, be rigid and intolerant of other people's views. And that happens if we can't really express our internal emotions. That can happen. That's a choice. 
Um, it should, it could show up like complaining, judging other people for what they're doing or not doing instead of just kind of doing more of our own thing. We could come across as just more um, incongruent. Um, we could be kind of seething inside or stressed inside, but not really um, expressing that to anyone, and that could be difficult. In those cases, it's hard for us to relate to others and others to relate to us because we kind of put up a wall. Next slide, please. So another choice. Uh, so this is more like the best of ourselves instead of the worst of ourselves, and I think this is where most of us would like to be. Where we're more humble, we allow and acknowledge the things that are going on inside of us. And we use it as a, a time when we can build our own insight and, and put our energy into what we could do with ourselves, how we can stay in connection with other people, and then have room for our internal process. So it's more like having an active hope. And if we can show up this way, it's, it's much better. Next slide, please. So what, we, what can we do to be our best selves? So I like this quote from Oprah. Breathe, let go, remind yourself that this very moment is the only one you know you have for sure. And you hear a lot about living in the moment. And why is that important? Well, if we live in the moment, then we're not dwelling on the past, worrying about the past. And worrying about the future. All those things are things we can't really control or, and they take our mind away from the time that we have now, the precious time that is now. So one of the best ways of doing this, I think, is breathing. So it sounds awfully easy, but um, it helps you think better. If you do some deep breathing and if you think better, then you make wiser choices and it's kind of a domino effect. So let's just take a half a minute here and try this. And this is the simplest breathing method I know. So we take a deep breath in and say either out loud or in your mind, I breathe in peace. I breathe out stress. I breathe in peace. I breathe out now, you can use any words that are important to you, like maybe you want to breathe in calmness and breathe out tension or something else, but use whatever words make sense to you. And if you just do that for one minute, then that actually grounds you and helps you a lot. Um, it promotes positive thinking, too, and they're doing more and more studies and learning that positive thinking is so beneficial because the negative thinking can lead us to lots of health issues, heart attacks, stroke. There's a number of things, and all causes of death are increased if we think negatively all the time. So it's bad for both our emotional and our physical health if we do that. But I want to give you an example. I was working with a client, and she's helping an emergency room team uh, with some team building and various things. And they're actually dealing, they're right in the middle of treating people with coronavirus. And they were very, very stressed. And she brought them this very simple breathing exercise that we just started to do. And they were so helped that they said that it really relieved a lot of stress because they had not even thought about themselves. They were just pouring themselves into everyone else and trying to help everyone else heal. So if it can help them, it can also help us. Um, next slide, please. So I'd like to give you a recipe for coping. Uh, the, uh, the recipe has three main ingredients. And we'll talk in detail about each of these. But the first one is figuring out your routine. And that has to do with how you spend your days. The second one is maintaining connections with others. So who do you connect with throughout your days? And the third one is practicing self-care and reflection. And now that we have the time and the opportunity, we can pour some of that into doing the self-care and the reflection. 
So next slide. So the first ingredient is figure out your routine. So this is a matter of you want to keep busy and have somewhat of a structure because a structure can be comforting. And we've all had a structure in our lives uh, before we were at home all the time. So it makes sense to be intentional about, so what, am I, what do I want my routine to be now? So even though things are kind of opening back up a little and maybe you're beginning to do some of the activities that you used to do, you probably are still spending more time at home than you were before it all started. So this, the, this could be helpful to you in, going on into the future. So I say get dressed, get up, get dressed, make a short list. And I say a short list because a long one can be difficult to accomplish, and then that could be discouraging. So I have a brother-in-law who, what he does is he takes a little yellow post-it note and he writes three or four things on it that he wants to get done that day. And at the end of the day, if he hasn't finished all the things, he just throws it away. He doesn't carry it over to the next day, which I thought was pretty smart because that way you don't have things piling up and things to feel bad about. So the idea of this is more to give you something to look forward to, something to accomplish, without necessarily making yourself feel like you have to be super productive, because that's not the point. We are still retired, right? <laughs> so um, the second one is positive movement. And so what does that have to do with emotional health? Well, it's it, physical health and emotional health can't be really separated that easily. Both of them are important. So if you can't get out to get a walk, um, so what if you're in the house, what do you do? Well, one idea I had was I'd like to, to follow an exercise led by somebody. So I went into Google and I, I Googled um, senior exercises. And first I got a few graduation things, <laughs> seniors graduating from high school. Then I saw on YouTube some exercises for seniors. And it was really nice because if you can't stand and do exercises, they had someone in a chair showing you how to do it in a chair. And then for those who had more flexibility and could stand up, someone else was standing up and doing them. So those are just some hints of ideas of things you can do when you're at home to keep your blood circulating. It's important. Keep the oxygen moving. That's better for everything about your body. And then your mind is more relieved, too, when you can do that. So uh, then I have hobbies on the list. What kind of hobbies do you have? Ask yourself. So maybe there's something new you want to learn, or maybe there's something you already enjoy doing. But just maybe part of your routine is to make sure you fit that in. If it's not every day, it might be every other day, or whatever you can. Like, for instance, I like to do watercolor painting, and I – find that, oh, I really want to do it, but I don't stop that often in the day to take time to do it. But if I just count on doing it, then even if it's just an hour, then at least I'm making progress and it makes me feel a lot better. So if you can't think of something, you know, maybe some people just like to read. Uh, if you're having trouble thinking about it or figuring out what you might want to do, talk to some friends and maybe they have ideas that you could you could use. So chores, ah, who wants to do chores? Well, we all have to keep things going with chores. And uh, one of the things that I learned to do that I didn't really do before was how to order groceries online. So I've been doing that throughout this whole time. And my sister even says that she doesn't know if she's going to go back to the grocery store because she likes having all those things delivered. <laughs> but anyway, that's a way to get a chore done. And it's can be something new to learn. Uh, sometimes it's things like gardening that you enjoy too, so that's helpful. And then taking online tours. Um, I don't know if all of you know this, but you can go online. There might be a place you'd like to go that you haven't been able to go. Uh, say you want to go to the Louvre in Paris. Well, how are you going to take a trip right now? None of us are doing that. So. What I did was I Googled the Louvre. I figured out how to spell it, L-O-U-V-R-E. And uh, they take you on a one-hour tour. It's just like you're a tourist walking through the Louvre. You see the Mona Lisa. 
these things are very uplifting. When you're finished, you feel like you've been to another place. So if you've had any trouble feeling kind of bored or there's just things that were on your bucket list that you never got to do, um, think about that, taking an online tour. And last but not least here is do not get an overload of negative news. I actually have friends who spend a lot of time watching the news. And if you get more than 30 to 60 minutes of that each day, it's really hard on your psyche. It's hard to uh, absorb all that because they kind of keep cycling it over and over again. And you really, how often do you need to hear how terrible things are? It's very hard. So, but different people have different amounts of that that they can handle. And in our household, um, my husband doesn't like to listen to it on TV at all. He just says it's talking heads. <laughs> he doesn't want them telling him how to think about everything. So he just goes on the computer, reads a couple of articles, and he's caught up for the day. Um, I do like to listen to about a half hour of the news. And so... I watch for times when he's not right there in the house where he would have to be subjected to something that I want to do. So there are ways to work it out. And, but it is really hard on people. And they're even saying, I think they even say this on the CDC website, don't get a lot of that negative news. It's hard on you. Next slide, please. We're now at ingredient two. So ingredient two is maintaining connection with others. How can you do that? Well, make a list of friends, family, and neighbors. Uh, I would would like to say, um, be sure you have some people that you trust a lot, that you have that are easy to converse with, and maybe that help you laugh. Um, that's one of the important things to me is I like to talk to people that I can who I can laugh with. And so, if you do that, just reaching out you can uh, initiate conversations with them. Maybe it's just on the telephone. Uh, maybe you can see them across the fence or in your lanai if you're sitting farther apart. And there's safe ways that you can do that, but keep in connection and touch with people. And if you're not normally the one who initiates, don't be afraid to do that because it's important that you let your needs be known. People can't read your mind for what you need. Uh, use technology. Now, we're all on Zoom, and if you can get on Zoom, you can use this kind of video call, either Zoom, you can use FaceTime, you can use whatever's available, Skype. And the way I did this is I had, my son and his family were planning to come for Easter, and we were so excited. It's gonna be, him and his wife and my two granddaughters. And um, Easter was when everything happened where traveling pretty much stopped. So they had to cancel their trip and I was so dismayed. So I decided uh, I could work something out with them. So I told them what I needed and wanted and I said, couldn't we, you know, how often could we <laughs> talk to each other on FaceTime? We all have iPads and iPhones so we can use FaceTime. And so they said, sure, and we worked it out once a month. There's a certain Sunday, and it's something I look forward to, I can count on. So I don't have to wonder, when are they going to have time to talk to me? So that was just so easy to arrange, and I hadn't really thought of it until I realized, oh, I'm losing connection with it. I was so happy to be able to see them. And we live so far apart. They're in Washington State. I'm here. We only get to see each other once or twice a year anyway. So that was a good way to work it out. And then the other item on this list is sharing photos or videos. Um, maybe you know how to do this with your smartphone. Take a picture, send it to someone, or ask your grandchildren to send you pictures or your, your children. Sometimes you can see what people's activities are. It's, it's kind of fun to see in a picture instead of just hearing about it. And if you don't feel you know how to do that with the technology, I'm sure you could find a friend who could help you with that. Um, I find myself helping other people, and sometimes you can just talk them through it on the phone or they can talk you through it, and you can see maybe it isn't so difficult to do that. It's just another way of connecting, and connecting is so important. 
Next slide, please. Before I go to ingredient three, I just wanted to uh, talk one minute about should we try to eliminate our anxiety? Is it bad to feel anxiety or anger or whatever underlying feelings are causing us stress and not worry, be happy? Well, no, I would not advise you to try to push down or repress feelings because that's not a very healthy way to deal with it. It just kind of builds up and makes you not feel good. But there are ways you can acknowledge what's going on and um, move on. So next slide, we'll get into it further. So this is ingredient three, and this is self-care and reflection. This is an important piece too. So I was just talking about emotions. Emotions give us information, but we don't wanna push them back or push them down. Um, if we recognize our feelings and try to identify what they are and what information they might be trying to give us, it's just a much healthier way to deal with it. So for example, uh, if we're having fear, it can tell you what you treasure and it can make you come up with ideas to keep yourself safe. So if you're having very much fear, you might say to yourself, well, how can I keep myself safer so that that fear isn't always there overriding everything? And anxiety can tell you that you need more clarity. You might need to understand better. Maybe there's some information you don't have that you might need um, that could calm you. It could be something even about there will be a vaccine developed. Uh, even if I don't feel safe going out right now, maybe I'll feel safer going out and doing things around people when I can take a vaccine first. And um, anger can support you and motivate you towards setting boundaries you might need to set because you know, if you're feeling angry, you might need to say, well, this is what I'll do. This is what I won't do. And then you're taking care of yourself by not letting yourself become overburdened or uh, taking on too much or being taken advantage of. So all these things give us information. Um, sometimes it helps to write things down. And I just want to mention that several of these items would be really good to write down. Uh, sometimes it helps just to have a little booklet or journal. I just bought this for a dollar or two at Walgreens, or you can get them at the grocery store. And um, so write down what brings me comfort. Sometimes we don't really think things through and put them in concrete terms. But if you can jot down what brings you comfort, you might come up with some ideas. What makes me laugh? What brings me joy? What brings me vitality? Um, what are my strengths? And what am I grateful for? Now, if you have trouble coming up with what your strengths are, and remember Lou brought this up in her talk about when she asked her clients to write down some things they liked about themselves, how hard that was. Well, you can, um, if you can't come up with it yourself, you can actually take an assessment online. There's one called viacharacter.org, and you can take a free assessment, and it tells you what your strengths are. I was surprised when I took it myself to find that my top strength was appreciation of beauty. And I thought, really, that's a strength that someone would put into an assessment? <laughs> And then the more I thought about it, the more I realized, yes, it, it is. It's, I do notice the beauty around me. It helps me be more grateful for where I am in this beautiful place. And I get great joy out of seeing a duck on the fence. <laughs> I take photographs, and I use them for inspiration in my paintings. So those things can really guide you to doing things that you care about. Um, Use guided meditations. I like doing this, and you can actually find quite a few of these um, in various places like on YouTube, uh, where someone is guiding you through kind of a peaceful and relaxing thing. And you close your eyes, and it just allows you to relax and feel more at peace. 
Um, there are, are many ways you can find these. And when, when you do things like that, then you incorporate some of the calming self-talk that can really improve your experience each day. Gratitude is so important. In fact, um, it's something you can write in your little notebook if you decide to try that. And you could write maybe some positive experiences that you had during a particular day. And what that does is it makes you more optimistic. Now, even though we're in tough times, there are usually some things we can find to be grateful for. Personally, I find that um, I'm fortunate enough to feel healthy right now. So I can say I'm grateful that I'm healthy. I'm grateful that my family and friends, I don't know anyone who has the coronavirus. I um, am grateful just for where I am and the beauty around me. There's so many things we can find. And then if you do jot them down, and maybe you have a day where you really have a hard time thinking about what you're grateful for. Well, on that day, maybe you can look back through your notebook and find something that you were grateful for yesterday or the day before, or last week. And um, you can use those again and remind yourself. Next slide, please. Okay, a few more tips. Now, we've got our recipe of main ingredients, and these are more like the things that hold the recipe together. So when we're adding spices and things. Slow down and be mindful. So this is just about acceptance and grace and time to integrate the various aspects of ourselves. If we had a recipe with yeast, this is where we'd be letting it rise. Just slow down. Being mindful has, to, again, to do with um, sitting with where we are and who we are. And then curiosity is a really good tool. It, it, we can observe changes in ourselves and in others. If we're wondering why we're feeling or behaving a certain way, ask ourselves. If we're wondering why someone else is behaving in a certain way, we can ask questions and find out more. And it really it builds empathy. And it helps you also when you're in extreme emotional feelings. Just ask yourself why. And then the last one, be compassionate towards yourself. It's not just for other people. Here's again where you can be a best friend to yourself. Treat yourself like you would treat a best friend who had a problem. Um, and just be compassionate and love yourself. Because, and remember to laugh. So, okay, next slide, please. Here's a review of our recipe. So we're figuring out our routine and we're being intentional about it instead of just defaulting to what we might normally do and feeling bad or feeling bored. We're figuring it out intentionally. We're maintaining connections with others. We're initiating them, not just waiting for others to contact us, which is another source of feeling bad. And then we're practicing self-care and reflection. And that gives us comfort and joy. That sounds like a Christmas song. Um, and we're adding large uh, doses of compassion, could you curiosity, and mindfulness, about, uh, and blending that all together, mixing that all together. And that's and our recipe me. for coping. Yes, absolutely. So, so this is the end of the main um, part of the Anger isn't just on rage, which back It could be anywhere Lisa on the continuum Ryan. from just being a little upset, being a little, okay, a little so um, we, irritated, a little bit annoyed, all the way over to being furious. We open it up so to, first thing to realize is we are not our feelings. So Lisa, I know you have some questions. Uh, and, and also that we don't have to follow up with behavior. So what I suggest is that when it's triggered, that you take those Six deep breaths. That's going to slow you down. And then you can focus inside rather than on others. Because if you focus anger on others, how approachable will you be? <laughs> you know, not very approachable. And so if you can identify the underlying feelings and you're saying, I'm feeling angry, what's it telling me? Then that takes the power away from it right there. 
and um, you identify what is going on, and maybe you can take some steps to help correct that. So, you know, some of us feel uncomfortable even feeling or expressing anger or even admitting that we have it, and that can come clear out of our childhood when we might have been told by our families, you know, that's bad, that's wrong, you can't you should never act angry or express anger. So then we push it down and then that's unhealthy. So I, I think it's just a, if we can come around to the idea, okay, I'm in my 60s or 70s, <laughs> I can say to myself, it's okay. I don't have to listen to the voices in my head from childhood. And I can say, okay, it's telling me something rather than just being, you know, triggered by it. And having it affect my relationship, because I don't want that. I don't want to spread it around. I don't want it to be something, oh, here comes Bonnie. She's spreading her anger around. <laughs> so that's just, not, that's just not something I want to do. And then we can say, okay, maybe it's trying to tell me I need to set a boundary or I need to figure something out. So if you have really low access to anger, it can be a problem, because then maybe you won't figure out that you need to set a boundary. But if you have high access, then you're in trouble too because it, it's too much to handle. So that's just anger. Then there's different things that are, we're told by other types of feelings like anxiety or stress. But. Thank you. Uh -huh. I have another question. Um, other than meditation, how can we live more in the moment? Can you give us some suggestions? Sure, yes. Um, so meditation is just one way to reach mindfulness, the mindfulness that we want to say, seek for being here now. Um, yoga is another way. A lot of people do yoga. Uh, another way is just sitting. I like to sit on my lanai or your patio or even in a ch favorite chair and breathing and breathing deeply. And that's, that brings you to the now. Um, here's, here's another little one I can tell you quickly. It's, it's called five senses. Um, five senses awareness. And so just for one minute, sit and see, what do I see? What do I feel? Maybe I see, in my case, I might see a duck on the fence. And I love seeing that. <laughs> or what do I feel? I might feel a little breeze. Um, what do I smell? What do I taste? All the things, the five senses, bring them all together. And then what you can do is just tune in and feel yourself sitting in the chair or where, whatever you're doing and gently bring your thoughts inside yourself. Take 15 deep breaths. Now that's, that's a way of doing it without having something that's structured or guided like meditation. And those of you who um, are religious, prayer can do that for you too. And whatever, uh, whatever it is that brings you peace and just helps you know that you are here now. Thank you for the suggestions. That was great. Yeah. I have another question. What happens if we don't have a lot of time for um, relaxation and you're exhausted because you're a caregiver? What if we don't have much time to ourselves and we're kind of searching for that time and place? Oh, that's such a good question. I've, I just know lots of our clients in TLC are in that situation, and maybe you're one of them. And if you are, my heart goes out to you. And I would say several things. Well, one thing is try to make sure that it's not just in your mind that you really don't have any time to yourself because there may be 30 minutes in the morning and 30 minutes in the afternoon that you could say, this is my time. Maybe it's when the person you're caring for is taking a nap or, or doesn't need your immediate attention. And just do one of these things that you set out your day to do if you're writing in your journal and you're saying uh, how many act, the, the three activities you wanna to do today. Um, maybe that's when you can do that, or maybe that's when you can sit and breathe and remember what you're grateful for. And another idea is um, with your loved one, 
think of some things that you can do that bring both of you peace. There might be, if that person is capable of uh, joining in with you, looking at a photo album, for example, of a trip you took that meant a lot to you, or taking one of these tours online with you, if they're able to do that, and then you can connect with each other in a way that's not just waiting on that person all the time, because you want to do things that don't, you, you don't want to build up resentment which is kind of a natural thing that can happen if all of your time is taken with caregiving. And, oh, boy, I would like to hear Lisa sometime, and I know she will, talk about some of the other ways that people can get respite care and um, so that they can take a little break or do an errand or something like that. Those things are so important to build in. Well, thank you for your presentation today. I am grateful for you and the knowledge that you shared with us today. You've given me some great tips for the week, and I'm going to implement those to see, you know, this is really stressful for all of us in all different ways. So I'm grateful so much for you and sharing what you have with us. It's been um, an amazing journey. So thank you, Bonnie. Thank you. You met my goal by saying that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you. All right, oh. so we're going to uh, we are going to pause the recording and we're going to open it up to our active participants to see if they have any questions that they would like to ask you, Bonnie. And so right. you know, I, I can, can relate. Just, so I can resume the video, which is <laughs> crazy. It doesn't give you that button, but go ahead, Bonnie. All right, we're back now, and thank you for your questions, everyone, and for your wonderful presence. Without seeing all of your faces, it would be harder to do this, and I really appreciate it. Um, TLC Services, we love our community. We're here for you. And for information and assistance, please check out our website. We've got lots of nice resources there. There's a big YouTube button where if you'd like to watch some of the videos we've made, these presentations and other videos, and um, or you can call if you want individual counseling. There's a phone number here, and there's one on the website, and that's 352-299-4017. Uh, so thank you, and I'll turn it back over to Lisa. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. Again, I'm Lisa Honka, and my company is called Your Key to Senior Living Options. I help seniors find independent, assisted, or memory care communities free of charge. I work with about 60 different communities in the area, but I also work with um, a community nationally. So if people are thinking about moving out of state or out of the area, I certainly can help them as well. Um, as I said, my services are free. And uh, if people are wanting to know more about long-term care, care insurance or VA aid and attendance or Medicaid, or even just, you know, what resources are out there for in-home services or companion care, I'm happy to help. Um, I've helped over a thousand families in the four years that I've helped my, my company, that I've had my company, and I'm very grateful for um, all the um, resources that are out there that help people stay safe. So everybody have a great week. Thanks again for putting this together, Maureen and TLC. Uh, uh, it's been a great journey, and I feel like I'm getting new friends. So this is really nice. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you all for joining us. Thanks, folks. See you next week. Bye-bye. Okay. Be safe. Bye. Everybody be safe. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye.